All right, so last time we talked about history of medicine from ancient times as best we can reconstruct it up to about the Renaissance. And today we're gonna to be doing our first bit of a, kind of a specialized trip down a topic to almost the modern day or practically the modern day, which is what health and disease actually are. What did people think it was to be sick or to be healthy? And so the, um, by the time we got to the Renaissance, late Middle Ages, the overwhelming uh, concept of disease had not really changed much from the time of Galen and Hippocrates. It was that you had a humoral imbalance that was making your body out of whack and that therefore you would be unhealthy. But how that actually happened wasn't really known. So people were still operating with that idea, but the medical researchers, as we would call them at the time, were very involved in classifying diseases and trying to kind of specify which ones are which. And if you think about disease in general, it's not always going to be obvious what disease someone has. Lots of disease has fever, swelling, you know, Ill, you know being uh, nauseated or vomiting. So there can be a lot of difficulties in figuring out exactly which illness someone might be suffering from. And they had to come up with lots of different theories on what would cause that. One of them was miasmas, bad air, often thought to be coming from swamps that would make people ill. Contagion, which was a rough kind of observation that you really couldn't avoid, is that by being around sick people, you yourself might fall sick. Disease did uh, seem to spread from person to person. Spiritual judgment, that was always still there in the background, that you might be ill because of something you or your parents or someone else had done that was making you ill. And then again, humoral imbalance. You just had too much blood, too little blood, too much black bile, and so forth and so on. And, can't miss all the time, diet. Diet can be involved with illness, and that's definitely for sure. People in the Middle Ages who you know, uh, were high up on the social scale were known to suffer from gout very frequently because wine and meat was very much something they could eat, and vegetables were considered to be low-class commoner food. So a lot of people who had gout were actually in the upper echelons of society. It was known as the king's disease a lot of times. So we talked last time about Andreas Vesalius, who kind of founded modern anatomy. He basically also had done some work on the cause of disease. He dissected several bodies, and he was looking at the things that were prominent there. But um, he was never really able to put those works out into print, and he had a big falling out with his colleagues at the University of Padua, and basically burned all of his notes in disgust as he left as a kind of... Uh, you know, farewell to them, and he went to go become the uh, one of the physicians to Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor at the time. So here is uh, actual footage of Vesalius quitting his job. There we go. Okay, I thought better than a little giggle, but I'll take the little giggle. So yeah, this is the medieval version of flipping your desk over in disgust. And so we really didn't have much in the way of disease, but shortly thereafter, uh, people, especially in Italy, did start to use dissection as a way to figure out how disease would spread. And uh, one of the early pathologists, Girolamo Fracastoro, thought that there might actually be what he called seeds of contagion that spread from person to person. And I mean, this could have led us down to the observation that bacteria or other unseen organisms might be able to spread from person to person. But that did not fit with the humoral theory of what caused disease, and so it was kind of dropped. However, he has become famous for naming and accurately describing the progression of the disease syphilis. And just in case any of you are looking for a challenge, he didn't do this by writing a journal article or publishing a book. No, he published that in a poem about a shepherd punished by the gods called syphilis. So just in case anybody wants a challenge, go publish your medical findings in poem format and see if you can get that to take off for you. So another early, what we would consider pathologist was a guy named Jean Ferrel, and he really did a lot to look at what disease, uh, how disease would manifest in his patients. So he wrote a book called Universa Medicina, and he really kind of commented on how therapeutics, pathology, and the physiology, based in the humoral theory of disease, would work. And he came up with an interesting classification series of diseases. It 
doesn't really make as much sense to us, but at the time it seemed to work. Classified them in the ones that affect the head, ones that affect the upper torso, the lower torso, ones that are hot or cold diseases. So again, classifying diseases was about all we could do without having an understanding of what could actually cause disease that went down to the cellular tissue or microscopic level. So the observations really got underway in the 17th century as dissection of criminals, but even of patients who suffered from disease became more and more frequent. And uh, there was a guy named uh, Marco Arillo Severino, and he had a whole book about swellings and kind of what were called buboes or tumors that would you know, ex you know, expand parts of the body. And interestingly, he had the exact opposite issue that we have today when it comes to dissection of bodies. Those days, it was generally criminals who were condemned to death that were dissected, and these tended to be young, relatively healthy people who had not yet aged to the point where they would have disease. So he actually was upset that he had so many young, healthy bodies to dissect, because he was thinking, the examination of a single body of one who has died of some disease of long standing is of more service to medicine than the dissection of the bodies of 10 men who have been hanged. So unlike what we have in our anatomy lab, where we have people who've had active disease processes probably for years and evidence of those diseases being kind of left on their body, he was left in the dark about what these diseases actually did to people when it went into their organs and so forth. So we had another person, Francisca Silvius, who was actually kind of someone who brought chemistry to the study of medicine. And he had what we will call the radical theory that biological processes were chemical reactions. And he thought that the acidity or alkalinity of the blood was actually what would cause disturbance. And, hey, not so bad. If you get respiratory or other types of acid acidosis or alkalosis, you can have some problems. Thankfully, our body does a pretty good job of balancing that, but if it breaks down, we are in fact in bad luck. And finally, we have what we might consider the first modern pathologist in the sense that he used a microscope. And this guy, Marcello Malfighi, is the person who first described a lot of microscopic things, including capillaries. So if you remember, uh, William Harvey was the English physician who described the idea that the blood circulated, but he had to theorize the existence of capillaries that would actually connect the arteries to the veins. Malfighi was actually able to draw and demonstrate these through his microscopic studies and show that the microscopic structure did actually allow the physiology that they understood to happen. And it was becoming more and more common for patients who died in hospitals to be uh, autopsied after death. And this allowed these university or hospital-based professors of anatomy or what we'd call surgery or pathology now, to look at what disease actually did to a human body. And these guys started to come up with uh, compendia, or kind of collections of the diseases they'd find. Now, the first guy who kind of did this was Theophile Bonnet, and sadly, his compendium suffered from the fact that it was poorly organized, you really didn't know where to look for things in it, but it does have one of my favorite Latin names of all time. Sepulcritum sive anatomica practica ex cadaveribus morbo dentatis. So study of pathological anatomy on the cadaver. So that was what was floating in the air. And then along comes a guy named Giovanni Battista Morgani, another Italian. He spent his entire career following patients through the hospital, doing autopsies on them after their death, and he wrote a massive compendium with an only slightly less cool name, De Sedibus et Causibus Morborum, The Seats and Causes of Disease. And this was a very comprehensive study of the patient's progression, their complaints, and the actual findings at autopsy. And he was able to show that disease did not result from too much blood too little yellow bile, too much black bile. He found causes of disease located in the organs. He found hearts that had stopped functioning or were scarred. He found bleeds in the brain. He found various organs had failed and that's what caused disease. And this really was the first time that we had an inkling that something besides the humoral theory of disease was involved. So there's a, I saw this online and I really wanna find this t-shirt.
So the other thing is, the book he wrote was an immediate success. A lot of these findings of groundbreaking work kind of are a little bit tough to see the immediate impact, but everybody in Europe wanted to copy this book because not only did it contain years of study from this guy, it also had a comprehensive index. So if you had a patient with a fever, you go to the index, fever. You find every case that has a fever and you start looking to see, do any of these match up with what my patient is showing? Maybe I can figure out what organ has gone bad with this person. And again, sadly, the therapeutics of the time really didn't let them do a whole lot with that, but they could at least try with the treatments that they had available, thinking that they had some idea about what was causing the problem. All right, so we generally don't think of the French Revolution as being something that really took uh, science and other things forward. And it's, you know, we generally think of it as a fairly destructive period of time. Started out inspired by the American Revolution, but quickly ran out of control into the, uh, you know, the reign of terror, executing lots of people, including scientists and um, other people. But the revolution actually did some impressive stuff for French medicine because French medicine was very hierarchical, very status and authority based, but when the revolution came along, those high status, high authority people tended to be some of the first to go to the guillotine. Meaning the younger, less rigid, less, uh, kind of less ensconced in the overall power dynamic people took more control and brought a lot of new ideas to French medicine. So I can't say that the French Revolution was good for everything, but it did help with a lot of the French medical establishment breaking from tradition and being willing to look at new things. But as mentioned, you got Antoine Lavoisier, gas chemist, get killed in the reign of terror due to his background as an aristocrat. But because of this, French pathology really became the highlight of pathology on the continent. And it kind of skips from country to country as we're gonna see. But we have several French pathologists, Marie-Francois Xavier Bichon and Jean Crovier, who not only looked at gross pathology, and by the way, the secret to making people think you know how to speak French is just saying it fast and confident. But they brought this gross appreciation of pathology seen in autopsy and started investigating the organs as they would be um, removed and taking sections from it and looking at it under the microscope. And what these guys basically found in the process of their investigation is that it wasn't actually organs that were the seats of disease, like we thought with uh, Morgagni, it was the tissues that make up the organs. You could have a tissue in an organ that was pathological, and yet the rest of the organ might be healthy. So we're actually getting to a smaller and smaller scale for where disease can affect the body. It doesn't hurt that they also put together very nice um, illustrated compendia of pathology. We can see here we've got some pericarditis. You can see the vegetable growths on the surface of the heart and the pericardium there. And these were things they noted in their autopsies and made sure to represent accurately in their works. So disease spreads a lot of different ways and the miasma theory of disease was something that was very persistent. So we're gonna start by talking about how cholera began to be one of the diseases people realized was not due to miasma, although that was its overwhelming cause. So Dr. John Snow, sorry, Dr. John Snow, <laughs> John Snow knows nothing. This John Snow knows some good stuff. Okay, that Game of Thrones reference barely landed. It's maybe got one more year. Okay, there we go. It's really sad when you have to cycle your jokes out because nobody gets them anymore. So John Snow was actually an obstetrician, but he noted that cholera, an epidemic that caused you know very massive, often fatal diarrhea, was affecting certain areas of the city and everyone assumed it was because they were closer to the Thames River. They were closer to bad air. But he did what's considered one of the first actual epidemiologic studies. He went around to the houses of people who had cholera and kind of tabulated which houses had people with cholera, how many people in the house had it. And he found there were very localized spots and he realized that the people who had cholera were all drawing their water from a pump on Broad Street. 
And this pump was renowned for having really good, clear water. People went there, and they, he found that even people who had died of cholera further away would get their water from this pump and take it to their house. So he had the pump handle removed, kind of famously, and the cholera epidemic that had started died off, but it's you know, widely assumed that he actually stopped a second cholera epidemic from happening because they broke down the pump and found that the walls of the well that it was pumping from had kind of rotted out and that a gigantic cesspool of human feces was leaking through the busted bricks into this drinking water and cholera as a fecal oral disease was getting into this pump and anyone who drank that water was likely to get it. Uh, he actually convinced people who were you know, very, uh, very focused miasmatists that he was right because he did really solid work outlining why he thought the disease spread the way it did. So miasma was kind of called off as the cause of disease for this, and it was the first real evidence that the disease spread through other routes, in this case, through drinking water. So at this time, Austria and Germany started to get a much more um, serious reputation for their medical activities, their medical practice. The problem was Austria and Germany had never had a French Revolution. That happened in France. But they were still had that, that was a joke, Okay, <laughs> but the, uh, in t the authority uh, hierarchies were still very rigid in these places. So there was a lot of top-down medical activity, but it was all very hierarchical, very much authorized from the upper echelon on down. So it's hard for new ideas to get a, a kind of a start there. And basically, the medical activity there was really strong. They started working on um, you know, mandatory autopsy for patients who died so they could always figure out what the cause of disease was. These hospitals almost became pathological factories for how they were able to follow the progression of disease to autopsy and starting with the patient's history. And so we had this huge hospital in Vienna called the Allgemeines Krankenhaus, just the hospital there, and it had roughly 14,000 patients coming through annually. So this guy was one of the early pathologists there. His name's Karl Rokitansky. And my absolute favorite bit of trivia from the history of medicine is this. Karl Rokitansky is the namesake for Mad Max Rokitansky, a.k.a. the Mad Max movies. The director of the Mad Max movies is actually a doctor. He financed the Mad Max movie, the first one, by doing extra shifts in the emergency room. And the Mad Max movies have lots of little medical trivia scattered throughout them, like Mad Max has a blown pupil, you get a pneumothorax in Mad Max Fury Road and stuff like that. So go watch the Mad Max movies and tell yourself you're doing your homework. It's not a bad way to go. But we had a real rigid um, hierarchy in here, and this is really typified by the experience of a, a Hungarian physician who was working in uh, Austria called Ignaz Semmelweis. This hospital had two wings in its maternity department, and one was staffed by midwives, and one was staffed by, um, by uh, physicians. And the physician's wing had a roughly 21% fatality for women who gave birth in it, whereas the midwife wing had around a 3% mortality. And they basically couldn't explain why, other than, oh, well, the midwife wing it's closer to the fresh air of the mountains. The other wing is closer to the, the miasmas of the uh, swamp. That's why people keep getting sick there. And women would actually try to postpone giving birth until they knew there were beds open in the midwife wing because everyone knew that your chance of surviving that wing were that much better. So, oh, my apologies, jumping fast. So Semmelweis noted this, but he thought that really didn't make any sense. It didn't make sense that they could have this consistent problem. They would shut the wing down, clean it, but have the exact same problem again thereafter. So he started having, he got to a point where he had enough power to have the physicians wash their hands. He realized these physicians would come in first thing in the morning and go do autopsies. This is long before latex gloves. So they would do autopsies and then Without washing their hands, they would go up to the maternity wing and go do pelvic exam from table to table to table to table to table. Basically, you couldn't come up with a better route for spreading infection from someone who passed away of an infectious disease to living people. The fact that the fatality rate wasn't higher is actually amazing to me. 
So he started having people wash their hands. Not even in a really caustic solution, but wash their hands before they would go there. And boom, the fatality rate dropped to around 3% in all the wings. Now this should have been a massive triumph and everybody should have been super happy about it. But because I phrased it that way, what do you think happened? Not a good thing. He was not a great communicator. He started trying to make sure that everyone did this, which was a good thing, but he communicated in such a way that he was just yelling at people, basically saying, you've been killing your patients for years. Why would you keep on doing this? Nobody wants, you know, even good intentioned physicians don't, would like to avoid realizing that they have been inadvertently murdering people their whole career. He was not a good communicator. He basically alienated everyone around him, and he eventually left to go do a hospital elsewhere and basically repeated a similar cycle of trying to innovate and then failing because he wasn't able to convey his ideas well. Uh, it's said that he actually was, he was actually institutionalized. He had some form of early dementia, probably frontotemporal dementia of some sort, and the, theory, uh, the saying goes he cut his finger in the uh, asylum and actually died of septicemia much like his patients had. Uh, there's actually been a study done on his bones thereafter. It's actually pretty conclusively established he was probably beaten to death by the orderlies in the asylum because the uh, mental health is another topic entirely I want to do a uh, talk on in the future, but it was not well taken, it was not well carried out back in those days. So yeah, he was actually beaten to death by orderlies, alienated from people, and the people who had, he'd alienated Dropped his, in, dropped his hand washing policies and the fatalities went right back up. It took years for his peers to work themselves into positions of power where they actually could say, hey, that really wasn't a bad idea, we should institute that again. So years and years of increased fatalities of what was called childbed or purple fever because of that. Now Vienna was also the place where we had the next dialing down of focus from the tissues to actually studying individual cells and pathological processes that affect those. So the big name here was Johannes Peter Mueller, and he made the discovery that cancer cells were actually modified normal cells. They were not a new set of cells, they were not an invading set of cells, they were regular cells that had somehow undergone a transformation and had become pathologic. That's pretty good. That's a really good legacy, but he had a little bit more because he trained several people who made some very impressive discoveries. Here's one whose name you recognize, Schwann. Now, in addition to describing Schwann cells, which make myelin, he's the guy who basically figured out that all animal tissues are, in fact, made of cells. This was not known at the time conclusively. There may have been cells but nobody could really prove that cells made up all human tissues until Schwann. And he got this idea from a friend of his named Schleiden, who had done the same thing for plants. So he said, hey, you should check out plants. Uh, we've done this in plants, you should check it in people and animals. And he did. Mueller also trained this guy, Joseph Henley. Loop of Henley, there we go. And you may like, oh, Loop of Henley, I like that, good job. You may not like him for this. He's the guy who came up with histologic terminology. So anytime we talk about stratified, squamous, cuboid, hey, you come up with a better idea. <laughs> you come up with a better solution first. But yeah, he's the guy who came up with that terminology we still use to describe cells, their appearance, their function, and so forth. And if that weren't enough, we have this guy, trained by Mueller, Rudolf Verkow. Now, we're going to go through Verkow in a moment, but... It's really tough to even know where to start with Verkow. So, you are all very smart people. We're all very smart people. Prepare to feel like an intellectual insect. Rudolf Verkow, age 22, studied under Mueller, studied histology and pathology. Age 23, became an assistant prosector at the Charité Hospital, so doing a lot of pathologic work there. Age 24, figured out what leukemia is. Age 25, graduated from medical school. <laughs> 26, founded a new journal which still exists. Its kind of nickname is uh, Verkow's Archive. Uh, simply to have room to publish all of his new findings and the findings of some select few friends. 27, 
wrote a report on a typhus outbreak that basically showed, hey, disease happens in poor areas, not because poor people are deficient or immoral, but because they have crappy infrastructure and no toilet facilities, no sewers, and so forth. And because he was basically saying that people are getting sick because they're low status, he got run out of Berlin. He got run out of the job because he had alienated so many of these high-status people and became a professor in Würzburg. After continuing to work and work and work for years, he was so famous, he returned to Berlin, was given a, share, a chair of pathological anatomy at the Charité Hospital, and he wrote even more papers on anthropology than he did on pathology. He was a huge proponent of public health, actually served in the Diet, or the governing body, in Germany, to, and took Berlin's sewers from the worst in Europe to the best in Europe, because he knew that hygiene and health were intimately connected. So, made sure that we had good drainage, good sewer, and water supplies. He was a really well-known politician on the progressive side, and uh, anybody know who the guy with the spiky helmet is? It's not the Kaiser. Bismarck, good job, that's Bismarck. Uh, Bismarck was a very establishment military German politician and he challenged Verkau to a duel. Uh, Verkau said, okay, we'll duel, but it has to be with scalpels. And then he said, okay, we'll duel, but here's what I'll do. I'm gonna take some typhus and inject it into one of two sausages. You and I will choose our sausages, eat them, and whoever dies, dies. Um, he was not taken up on that offer for the duel. And if that weren't good enough for y'all, he was there when Troy was discovered. <laughs> so yeah, I encourage you all to be like Verkau, but don't be sad if you don't quite reach that same level of accomplishment. And one other thing, anthropology, he was also ahead of his time in another way. He was really annoyed by the anti-Semitic parties and anti-Semitic groups in Germany at the time. And he did a study of Jewish and quote unquote Aryan school children in Germany and showed that very few Aryan school children had blonde hair and blue eyes and that around 14% of Jewish school children had blonde hair and blue eyes. And much later in life when Hitler came along, he used every opportunity he had to rip into how terrible Verkau was and what an awful guy Verkau was. So he also managed post-mortem to make a lifelong enemy of Adolf Hitler. So there we go, what a guy. <laughs> Possibly even more familiar to us is Louis Pasteur. Now Louis Pasteur is a little bit of a break from our standard because he was not a physician. He was a chemist. He worked in chemistry, and actually his first work was on chirality, the fact that molecules can have two different ways of forming that are kind of mirror, image of, mirror images of each other, so an L and a D form. And he used the microscope to kind of look at how things were formed, and he observed germs. He was able to figure out, huh, there's these little things present in water, in the air, and other places. They were called animolecules at the time, because little living you know, small objects, so animolecules. But he was able to use that ability to use the microscope to solve some real problems. The uh, French uh, wine industry was in a lot of problems because they had a lot of batches going bad. The fermentation was not working. And so he found that in the good batches of wine and beer, there was yeast. He didn't know what it was at the time, but he always found yeast. Whereas in the bad batches, he found bacteria and was basically able to say this is why it's going bad and on top of that came up with a way to fix it. What do you think the name of that process is? Pasteurization. You can warm it up enough to kill the bacteria but not denature the substance entirely and it makes it you know, pretty much safe. Similar thing happened with the silk industry. The silkworms had a disease. He was able to show it was due to a bacteria and came up with ways to deal with it. He also came up with a way to disprove a very commonly held um, assumption, which was life spontaneously generated. If you had meat, it would spontaneously produce maggots that would become flies. People didn't realize, oh, it's because the flies land on it, lay eggs, and it makes maggots. Oh, d dirty rags, those make mice. Because where do you see mice? They're always in these dirty rags. The theory was that life just spontaneously happened from certain sources. He showed that food wouldn't actually rot if you left it exposed to the air in such a way that dust couldn't get to it, but as soon as you let the dust and other activities in the air reach it, 
then those things, which turned out later to be bacteria, could work on it. So microscopy, Louis Pasteur really did a good job of bringing that. And one thing Pasteur was, above all else, was he was a consummate communicator. He was a showman. He made sure that not only did people understand what he was saying, he beat them over the head to make his point. So we also, and we'll bring him up again in the treatment of disease talk next time when we talk about rabies. He was also involved in solving the problem of what caused rabies. So now that we had specific microbes, we, the problem became which microbes are responsible for which diseases. And this guy, Robert Koch, was the person who figured out what was causing certain diseases like tuberculosis. He found that if you had tuberculosis, you always could isolate a specific microbe from it. And if you took that microbe and exposed a healthy animal to it, it would develop that same disease. And he came up with a list of what's called Cox postulates about ways to prove that a specific organism causes a specific disease. He also figured out how anthrax is caused. That's the very uncomfortable looking disease that's shown here because it's another bacteria, but was able to show that that disease only happened if you were exposed to that specific bacterium. Now, they had a really good run actually not only in Europe, but in Japan. Japanese pathology and microbiology actually was a real early scientific uh, kind of advancement in Japanese culture. But uh, they ran up against viruses, and there was nothing people could do to figure out what was causing viral diseases. They only knew that something small enough to get through every filter they could imagine and that could not be seen in a microscope was still causing certain diseases. So those viral diseases resisted their, their uh, capacity to diagnose and spe specify what organism was responsible for a long time. We're now going to shift gears and talk about other concepts of disease and talking about mental activity. And really key here, we have phrenology. So an English physician, Franz Joseph Gall, came up with phrenology and it was based around the idea that the brain had specific quote unquote organs inside of it that were responsible for very specific functions. And that if you had a really keen function in an area, that part of your brain would be enlarged. And his idea was, oh, well that means that the skull in that idea will be enlarged. And so he would palpate people's skulls, like, oh, fascinating, yes, yes, you're very spiritual, I can tell by like tapping on your parietal lobe right here, parietal bone right here. He was not tapping on the, on the lobe. But basically, this was very popular, but quickly fell out of favor because people realized it was garbage. It didn't, you know, no matter what happens in your brain, it doesn't leave a mark on your skull. And as soon as people tried to, you know, double blind study things and see if phrenologists could come up with the same findings from person to person, they knew it didn't. So by the 1840s, for not, oh, and it doesn't help that anthropologists at the time were obviously looking at phrenology as a way to quote unquote rank the races. Which race do you think came out on top? Bunch of European, bunch of European researchers? Yeah. So phrenology was basically a way of institutionalizing the racism in the society using science as a means to do it. So in addition to phrenology, uh, phrenology there were things like uh, anthropomorphic uh, studies of the body, and it always came down to a racial discrimination using that as a basis. But to people's credit, they realized this really was garbage. It did not work. And in terms of mental activity, it was replaced by a globalist view of diffuse brain activity. The idea then became, okay, the brain, it doesn't have regions of centralization. It doesn't have areas that specifically work on one thing. It's a global network that interconnects, and that's that. Now, phrenologists were wrong, but they weren't completely wrong. There are, in fact, areas of the brain that are specialized for certain functions. So the globalist view was a reaction to phrenology, but it basically had to buy back a lot of its assertions because with study, it became clear there were areas of the brain that had specific functions. And the first real evidence of this came in 1848, and there was a, ra a railway foreman named Phineas Gage. Now, has anybody, who's heard of the Phineas Gage story before? That's like everybody, okay. Well, first off, good on you. Secondly, you can go see Phineas Gage's skull and the tamping rod that went through it in the Harvard Medical History Museum. So if you're ever in Cambridge, Massachusetts, go to the Harvard Medical School and go check it out. Now, 
What's hilarious to me is this is Harvard in a nutshell. It's the Harvard Medical History Museum. It's the hallway in the office building of their medical school. <laughs> And his skull's just sitting there. I mean, it's this crazy cool stuff, but it's just a hallway with a lot of cool cases and so forth in it. But basically, he was working on the railway line. They were blasting some rock to clear space for the railway, and one guy ahead of him would drill into the ground, another guy would fill it with gunpowder, another guy would put a tamping bit of cotton in there, and Phineas Gage would come down with a heavy iron rod, kind of pack it down, and then they would set it off in a controlled explosion later. Well, the guy in front of him with the cotton wadding, missed a hole. And his rod went down there, sparked something, and the tamping rod shot through his skull from under his zygomatic arch and out the top of his left frontal lobe. The, uh, the rod came to rest about 30 feet away, and the rod was heavy. It was like around an 8 to 12 pound rod. And the fact that, A, he survived the trauma of this, and B, survived without getting a massive infection thereafter. So the fact that he lived at all is amazing. But afterwards, his behavior had completely changed. He had been a very reliable, trustworthy, calm person, and he became very erratic. And we now know, yeah, executive function in the frontal lobes, your ability to control your behavior, to control your impulses, a lot of that had been damaged. Now, a lot of stories about him say that, yeah, he was just an erratic, crazy person for the rest of his life. It's actually not true. He, got, he was able to adapt a little bit, got a, co a job actually as a stagecoach driver in Argentina, and was buried in San Francisco. And it's kind of a miracle they were actually able to get permission to bring his skull back to Harvard thereafter from his family. But it really showed that his brain, his change in behavior was due to an isolated injury. Further along, we had some French pathologists, Broca and Wernicke, and they had patients who had aphasias, an inability to utilize language. And Broca showed people with an expressive aphasia had a specific lesion, and it was always in the same place. It wasn't all over. It wasn't global kind of destruction of the brain. It was a single spot located in what we now call Broca's area, and likewise, his colleague Wernicke showed that if you had the same sort of damage but further up towards the parietal, you could have a receptive aphasia. So we're finding that there are, in fact, specific areas of the brain devoted to specific functions. So the question then becomes, well, what is the brain? If the brain is responsible for our mental activity, how does it work? The brain is really tough to deal with. You guys have felt what an embalmed brain is like. Fresh brains are even more kind of like difficult and kind of insubstantial. They're very you know, soft, fatty, they don't stain well. But Camelio Golgi, an uh, Italian histologist, figured out that you could use silver type stains to actually see the cells in the brain, and he came up with a staining method and stained various parts of the brain. And his findings were, well, the brain is a massive interconnected network. Every cell in the brain is connected to every other cell in the brain, and that's how it works. A Spanish histologist, Spanish medicine and science was really primitive, but we had this one light of uh, Spanish science, a guy named Ramon y Cajal, worked on Golgi's staining method, but got really good at it, and found that there were, in fact, visible gaps, very tiny, but visible gaps between nerve cells. And there were different types of nerve cells in different parts of the brain, but that there was a gap we now call the synapse. And so, and they really did not like each other because their findings contradicted one another. And, you know, Golgi was a very well-respected um, histologist. Ramon y Cajal, not so much. But it has to have been very awkward because they both won the Nobel Prize in medicine and had to stand on the stage next to each other accepting the prize because apparently the Nobel Committee didn't realize they detested each other and their theories actually contradicted. But they did show us what the brain is actually made of and made it possible to kind of start looking at how the brain interacts. So yeah, awkward, but they did do the work. All right, time to talk America. American medicine actually did have a pretty solid start post-revolution. The uh, Philadelphia hospitals were considered to be really pretty solid. And uh, this is a famous painting called The Gross Clinic. It's named after Samuel Gross. He was a surgeon, but he also gave the first regular classes in pathology in the United States. Now, Surgery, we're going to have a whole talk on it. It's the fifth talk in this series. Fourth talk, pardon me. But it's basically 
the idea at the time was surgery had to be fast because post-surgical infection was almost inevitable. There was no concept of sterility or antisepsis, things like that. And Gross thought, well, oxygen is obviously the cause. Surgery has to be quick because if we leave the body open to oxygen, that's what causes these diseases. And so causing the tissue dam damage. And this fit the mold for surgeons at the time. They were most kind of comfortable when they got a chance to work quickly. Now, American medicine, again, it was really pretty solid until the Civil War. The Civil War not only killed many, many Americans, it just completely devastated the American economy. You have a war at home, guess what? All the damage is done at home. You've got to rebuild all those things. All the economies are shattered. It's just going to make everything hard for at least two or three decades thereafter. So American medicine slid real fast into kind of just being rotten. So American medicine, there was no licensing body of any kind. You could just call yourself a doctor. If you did train with somebody, you were probably apprenticed under them for a couple of years, and then boom, you're a doctor, you get to go practice. People who had the means would go to Europe to study medicine and then come back, but these were people who had to have the independent wealth to afford to do that and go to the various hospitals, learn the modern techniques, and then bring that back to America. That's not really sustainable for getting the whole country on a solid medical background. So the turnaround came with the founding of the Johns Hopkins University and the Johns Hopkins Hospital and Medical School in Baltimore. So the founder, Johns Hopkins, was a railroad tycoon, and in his will, he founded the school, but also the medical school and hospital, and had stocks in the railroads to back it up. The problem is, by the time they were ready to move ahead, those stocks had lost a considerable amount of value and they weren't enough to actually get things rolling. So to make sure it could happen, a lot of the trustees of the school, their wives and daughters said, hey, we're well connected. We will go get the funding. We'll raise the funds. But if we do it, you have to agree to our demands. And they are that Hopkins was to be a postgraduate medical school. This was unheard of. People had to have a college degree beforehand. Students were expected to read English, French, and German because that was the language that science was being distributed in. That sounds a little rough. It had to be associated with a teaching hospital. You actually had to have clinics nearby where people could do clinical research and rotations, and the medical faculty there would not practice outside of that university system. They had to be available for the students. They couldn't just be doing private practice and popping into the university and hospital randomly you know, just kind of sporadically, and women were to be admitted on the same basis as men. Which one of these do you think was the sticking point? That's right, it was the last one. But the trustees had no choice. This was the only way they could get the school to open. And so Hopkins started, opened in 19, uh, 1893, with the stipulation that women were to be accepted on the same basis as men. And that was true. It wasn't, they still probably weren't treated completely on the same level, but they were allowed in. That was a step forward. 1893, check this out. The first osteopathic medical school opened in 1892, allowing all women and all minority students to apply with equal footing one year ahead of time. But we never hear about that. So let's give it up. Yay, osteopathy. <laughs> And even, I can't find a better picture, but there are, in fact, these are all the women that were in the first graduating class of that uh, school in Pikeville. All right, so I've given some backhanded compliments to Johns Hopkins. Now I'm going to give actual compliments to them. The uh, people they found to staff the teaching um, of the medical school were top drawer. They were amazing. The first guy who was going to teach uh, pathology there was named William Welch, and he had studied in... Europe and really knew his histology, his pathology really well. He discovered the bacteria that's responsible for gas gangrene. We call it Clostridium perfringens now, but it was actually named after him initially. And he trained lots of residents that on, went on to win Nobel Prizes. So lots of people who came around and did amazing pioneering work got there because of his encouragement of research and basing their learning on clinically observable phenomena. Now we'll come back in the surgery talk and some of the others to talk about some of these other people, but it was an all-star list of initial faculty at Hopkins that really set it apart. 
So Hopkins had opened 1893. In 1910, the Carnegie Foundation, knowing that medical education and medical practice in America was really backward, commissioned a guy named Abraham Flexner to write a report on the status of medicine in America. And this Flexner report basically said, it's pretty awful, but Hopkins is a bright light. We should actually have the Hopkins model be the standard American model. And the Rockefeller Foundation said, well, we'll pledge 50 million bucks in 1910 dollars to have those practices implemented. And schools that did got to stick around and other ones were regulated out of existence. Now, first off, this would not have panned out perfectly well these days. Abraham Flexner was the brother of one of the professors at Hopkins. He was the sole author of this whole paper. And it's not that he was wrong, but he had a definite bias in favor of the Hopkins model. And the Flexner report did several things. Medical education did, in fact, become more uniform, and there was a lot more quality control. Basic science and laboratory teaching were considered to be integral parts, followed by clinical training. And basically, frauds, charlatans, they were less able to scam people because medical education was becoming better. But the AMA became the dominant voice in medical education in addition to medical practice, and they were given ammunition to attack competitors like osteopaths, midwives, and others. So that made it very difficult for any competitors of the MD population to really maintain their ability to teach. And the MD schools decreased as the ones that could not maintain the Hopkins level of quality were shut down from 131 to 66, but the osteopathic schools went from around eight to six. So question mark, because it's not really known what might have been the death knell for some of these schools, but the Flexner report locked osteopathic medical schools out of a lot of the funding streams that were present for MD schools. And that's one of the reasons why there's been a long road toward the equality Arguably, we haven't quite reached it yet, but also the opportunities for research and development present in osteopathic schools compared to some MD schools. So improved funding, and DO schools were actually ineligible for federal state funding until the 1960s. So again, kind of a long shadow, some good things, some bad things, depending on your perspective. Now, a big step forward in the mid-1900s came from the same process we've seen before, looking at where disease exists and finding smaller and smaller venues or more finely detailed venues where it can happen. And molecular biology and genetics, the main events in making those happen all came within about a 15 year span. So in 1940, someone named George Beadle and Edward Tatum showed that proteins were actually connected to heritable genes. Protein structure somehow had a hereditary basis. Wasn't known what, but proteins somehow had a basis in genetics. Oswald Avery linked genes to DNA. Now we always think of Watson and Crick, but they figured out the structure of DNA, but he was the first person to think, huh, this DNA might actually be the stuff carrying heritable traits. Up until then, it was just considered like cellular junk or some sort of like kind of ballast in cells in the nuclei to help them function. But he came out with the idea that it could actually be the source for these heritable genes. And using X-ray diffraction that we will say was <clears throat> borrowed from their colleague Rosalind Franklin, James Watson and Francis Crick described the double helix pattern of DNA. Now, Rosalind Franklin died of cancer shortly thereafter. So we will never know her side of the story, but it is pretty clear they took the data from her desk and did not credit her with having helped them in any way, shape, or form. And there are people who say she's the one who figured it all out and they took all the credit. Others say she probably shared it with them, but we don't know because she died thereafter. We'll never know for sure, but it's not a good look when you don't even refuse to acknowledge the, the contributions of a person thereafter. So Rosalind Franklin should at least be mentioned on equal par with the other two in the discovery of the double helix structure of DNA. And then Toronto, Lapche Sui, discovered that genes can become mutated in cystic fibrosis. This is the first disease that was found to exist because of a mutation to a single gene. You have the CTFR receptor, uh, ion transport pump, moves chloride into your airways. If that pump is mutated or non-functional, chloride doesn't go to the airways, water does not follow it, mucus becomes very, very thick and viscous and hard to move, and people with cystic fibrosis wind up having 
repeated infections and blockage of the airways due to that thick mucus that's no longer as fluid as it should be. So all of this occurring in a really short span of time. And we still have genetics and molecular biology being applied to medicine. CRISPR is a, you know, a new thing that's going to be really big in our careers. I've been around, I'm not so old, but I've been around long enough to see some of the amazing things happen, like the uh, genome project. And here's the thing. Every time there's a big project like this, there's CRISPR, there's other things, they're going to say, this will solve all disease. This will be the key to understanding everything. It never is. But it always sets us up for better and better discoveries. The Genome Project didn't do what people would say it did in making sure that we have every gene understood because there were lots of actual epigenetic factors influencing how genes are expressed. It wasn't just a matter of getting the, uh, the phone book of genes. It was a matter of understanding how they're regulated. But that process brought us further and further. CRISPR will probably have some amazing applications, but it's not going to solve everything. But you don't get funding if you don't say we are going to solve everything with our brand new discovery. So just be aware, don't buy into the hype, but also don't dismiss the thing simply because of the hype. There's always, it, it's never as good as it sounds, but it's often quite good when you have brand new therapies and investigations coming forward with new tools. Okay, next time we've talked about disease and health. We're going to talk about what people tried to do about it all throughout history. So diagnostics and treatment is going to be next time. Thank you all so much for coming. Make sure you use your QR codes, get credit for having been here, and fill out the survey. Thank you.